This is Professor Wes Porter. We're talking about the Federal Rules of Evidence, in particular Rule 104, and I'm going to cover uh, specifically in the next slide A and B. Uh, they're the most important parts of this rule. They can be covered in separate videos. The other part of the rule that I think is important to know is it, that nothing in this rule, this is uh, 104E, nothing limits the ability of a party to put on something as it goes to the weight and credibility of other evidence. So you can put on evidence that sort of bolsters or detracts the uh, and affects the weight or credibility of other evidence. You often hear this expression, the weight of the evidence, um, as a proponent's response to an objection. So that is, let's say uh, an opponent stands up in the middle of someone asking about the uh, color shirt uh, a criminal defendant was wearing. And you can picture the, the opponent coming up and saying, objection, irrelevant, does it really matter what color shirt? There's a lot of people that have green shirts. And a popular response is, Your Honor, this goes to the weight of the evidence. That is, sure, they can make this argument, but that's just how much the jury should put in this evidence, how much they should weigh this evidence, it should not go to admissibility. So the expression that you hear is this goes to weight, which means it should come in and they can argue that it doesn't mean much or doesn't advance that cause much, not admissibility where it's kept out. But nothing in this rule gets in the way of um, essentially putting on evidence that, uh, that goes to the weight or credibility of other evidence. First, let's talk about A. I think this is a very important uh, part of the rules because it goes to the process of what happens during objections and what the court can do. And it's sort of buried in the headline here. The court can decide a preliminary question. Okay, what's that about whether a witness is qualified? That's pretty unique and we'll cover that. And when we talk about Article 7, when we talk about experts, uh, who's qualified and that's a, it's a legal determination and the court's going to make it and they're going to do so before they even let the witness testify. Whether a privilege exists, often not before court, you're going to have a challenge to privilege. You're going to have arguments about privilege. You might have privilege log from one side or the other, but that's a determination. That's a legal determination that the court makes and it makes it before trial, before we get to it. The last part is the most important part. The court decides a preliminary question about whether evidence is admissible. So just imagine there's lots of times where the evidence, where the court has to consider a bunch of stuff to decide whether something's going to happen. So imagine uh, in a contract deal, um, you know, a contract case or, or some type of agreement between one of the parties says, has an out of court statement that says, that's it, we got it, we got a deal. And we're deciding whether that statement is admissible at trial. Of course, one side thinks it should be admitted. The other, th the other side has made some type of objection, likely hearsay that it should not be admitted. And they're arguing about whether that statement, uh, we've got it, we've got a deal, uh, should be admitted at trial. Well, imagine if the court said, well, I need to know the context. Give me all the communications. Give me the letters back and forth. Give me the text messages. Give me the transcripts of the phone call that where they were having. And the court can consider all that stuff. They can decide whether evidence is admissible and look at this last line and they are not bound by the rules of evidence in doing so. So I can, as a trial judge, I can look at uh, something that's uh, potentially hearsay because it's not, I'm not bound by the rules in deciding a motion. So you see this in multiple choice questions sometime. Can the court consider this obvious hearsay? Can the court consider this thing that has obvious uh, uh, problems against the rules? The court can consider it in ruling on whether something else is admissible. So it's very important. Easiest way to think about it is when we get evidence from a company, when we subpoena a company and we ask them for documents that come back and they come back in a nice bound, here are all the documents you requested. And on top of it is usually a certification. It's a certification under Article 9 that says this stuff is what it is. These things are our business records under 8036, whatever. They have a big affidavit from someone who's a custodian of records that says this is the stuff that you're looking for. Well, imagine Imagine when the court rules whether the exhibits or maybe just one uh, exhibit that was subject to that subpoena, when they, when they rule on whether that's admissible or not, they consider that affidavit. And you'll learn when you go through the hearsay rules, that affidavit is an out-of-court statement that's offered for the truth of the matter asserted. It's absolutely hearsay, but the judge can consider that certification in deciding whether the underlying documents are admissible. So remember 104A, the court can consider everything except privileged material, anything whatsoever, in deciding whether something is admissible. So that last part, the court must decide preliminary questions that the evidence is admissible is not bound by the rules.
Now, 104B handles something entirely different. It's called conditional relevance. And that is sometimes you're arguing to get something in and it's dependent on something being true, a fact being true. And maybe just by the order of trial, you're out of order. You're trying to put in the uh, photograph, for instance, but you haven't proven the fact that you need to make the photograph relevant. So I always like to think of, I got a, I got a, um, a door in the house and it looks like a bullet hole in the door. And I want to put in that, uh, I have a, the witness on the stand, the officer on the stand, and I want to put in that picture of a, of a door with a bullet hole in it. Well, part of the argument's going to be that wasn't a bullet hole at all. It was a blowtorch that did that. And they're going to learn later on in trial through a different witness that this defendant has a blowtorch and uses a blowtorch and made that hole with a blowtorch. Well, the, the batting order of trial is out of sync. So what you would do as the proponent, objection relevance, Your Honor, under 104B, under conditional relevance, we will be able to tie up later on that this photo is relevant because it's a, it's a hole in the door, but it's also going to be more uh, relevant once connected up with this blowtorch evidence that we'll put on later. So think of 104B conditional relevance is, I have a batting order problem, a sequencing problem with how I'm going to present things at trial. And maybe something that I wish that I had before the court, had before the jury right now at the time when I'm admitting this evidence, is just gonna come in a little bit later. So 104B operates like a promise. I promise that thing's going to come in later, and when it does, it'll tie this up and make sense. And you're allowed to do that uh, if that uh, photo, that evidence of the um, blowtorch doesn't come in later, then that fact doesn't exist, and this thing will uh, not be this uh, evidence of the photograph won't be relevant now. So it's a promise, a condition because of the sequencing in order of trial. You can use the expression conditional relevance as it relates to 104.